most frequented website? For me, it's probably Twister Data, which is a computer modeling website. Um, I use that, obviously Facebook, Twitter, all the social medias are right up there, but as far as my job goes, I'm always computer models, weather tap is where I do satellite radar, um, and then on my phone, Radar Scope is the app I go to. Favorite reality show ever? Ever? Teen Mom and Teen Mom 2. <laughs> it's, yep, <laughs> that's it. Okay, that's great. <laughs> That, that's, a, that's a new fact. Yeah. And the one movie you could watch forever? The Goonies. It's my favorite. It's so nostalgic. There's a whole summer, actually, that I fell in love with weather. It was because we had a super stormy summer, so we'd always have to come in off the beach. I'd fall in love with the storms, and then we had the same VHS that we never took back to Blockbuster or whatever, and so we just watched The Goonies over and over, and Cocktail. But I'd say The Goonies forever, because I am a Goonie forever. Do you still have that, that VHS tape? Somewhere? Not that VHS, no, but I've got it on DVD, of course. If you had to sing karaoke to just one song, it would be... <laughs> you have to ask my son, my poor kid, he hears the same songs because I only know like five songs, all of the words. And so it would be Jewel, um, uh, You Were Meant For Me. Oh, that's great. Yeah. If you could pick any dance partner besides Val or your husband, it would be... Justin Timberlake. Don't even need a second to think about it. I want to dance like him. Actually, can I have both Justin Timberlake and Usher at the same time? Great things. <laughs> oh my goodness. Biggest guilty pleasure? <laughs> Biggest guilty pleasure. Oh, man. I'd say, because I would have said Teen Mom, because that's the thing that I don't tell everybody, but that I absolutely love watching. Um, but yeah, I'd say just like, if I could do a Netflix six hour block, now that I have a baby, that doesn't happen anymore. But that type of viewership of television is probably my guilty pleasure. Complete the phrase, if I could tell my 20 year old self just one thing, it would be? Oh, I've thought about this a lot, actually, in my life. And I would be, stop worrying. Because what you're worried about right now will probably not matter tomorrow, definitely won't in a week, and absolutely will not in a year. Most things don't. And complete the phrase, to be a leader or to be a mogul is? To be a leader or to be a mogul is uh, doing everything that you do, whether, you know, no matter how you're leading, uh, with gratitude. And I think if you do that and you put it out there that you know it took a lot to get here and you know that you're fortunate to be there, everything else follows. Beautiful. Beautiful. So we're going to open it up to questions now that um, our mogul followers have um, contributed. Mm -hmm. And again, everybody um, watching, tuning in, you too can get in on the action if you go to www.onmogul.com. Uh, please, please ask away. Ginger's yes. taking questions about anything and everything, including Teen Mom. Yes. Okay. What? Or Teen Mom, too. Like, I'm expert on both. Did it teach you about motherhood? I, I don't know. I mean, I think what's what they've done well is reality has stayed reality. I don't feel that there is the need for any pushing of producing. Um, there's definitely been changes in the way that they do that show, but I have fallen in love with those girls since they were 16 and pregnant, and there's something about that that I'm hooked and the kids, I mean, they're now seven, eight years old and, but I'm stuck. I need to know more. I need to know. It's like your friends that had babies and they had, they've, they've had a difficult time. No matter if they've got a TV show and that means they got a car, it doesn't make it any different. They still have children and that's what's relatable. All right. Question number one, what does your job consist of? So mm -hmm. what, what's a day in the life of for Ginger's Oh my gosh. Um, so it's not always the same. It's often quite different, but a regular day for me would be waking up around 3.34 and then um, getting to GMA. I usually look at my computer modeling the night before because a lot of them get in before I go to sleep. Uh, so I've kind of forecasted the generic general view, the jet stream, how it's moving, how, and then I kind of focus in in the morning on where the headline is that I'll be covering. So whatever the biggest story across the nation is, or sometimes the world, like today we had a typhoon that ended up being the biggest story. Um, so that's what I focus in on. A lot of my morning is, is spent looking for images and video. We're responsible, myself and the other meteorologists on my team are responsible solely for finding all the video and such. So I take a big part in that. Um, and then the makeup, the hair, everything happens. And by 6.20, I'm doing promos with affiliates. So we really start much earlier than the actual show starts at 7. Shows from 7 to 9, we often do some meetings and things happen you know, right around there. I sometimes get a break. If I have a shoot or something, I'll go run and do that. But we get a break like 10.30 or 11 until maybe 2. And then I go back to work for the evening news a lot of times um, with David Muir. And so I do world news. Uh, that's a normal day. Now, obviously, when I'm on a hurricane, like last week when I was in Florida, there is no stopping. You're working all platforms all the time. There's 
constant on the go because you're reporting and you're doing your your anchoring parts and it really ends up feeling like you're on a 24-hour news network because there are so many things pulling at you which is one of my favorite places to be because all I'm doing in those situations is talking about something I love and that's the atmosphere and just a point of clarification you are an actual meteorologist yes you are following it's, it's a misnomer I think sometimes and oh, it's something you've so worst about, about yeah. the quote-unquote weather girl right no weather girl is the worst thing you could say to me um, I'm a meteorologist that is my label um, I think it's very easy for people to do that because they just rely on what they know stereotypically of the past and there were weather girls and weather men there still are some um, but I think the general trend is that everyone is going to science you have to know what you're talking about they're not gonna pay two people someone behind the scenes and someone in front to do this job and when you're on I don't use a script everything I do is just coming out of my mouth and out of my brain it's so funny because I think our legal department was asking once well where did that come from like who do we credit and I'm like no, us like our brains <laughs> it's from us so I think knowing that things can change and it's wild but a woman wearing a dress can also be a scientist I know crazy um, I am on a crusade to get that out there because I think it's a really important topic for young women, um, especially children in general, that science STEM is so big right now. But I still feel like I could go out on the street right now and if I get recognized, 50% or more are gonna say you're the weather girl. And that's upsetting, that needs to change. We need to just inform and educate because labels are important in many parts of life. Uh, my mom's a nurse practitioner. She has three master's degrees and has worked her whole life. So for her to be called a candy striper is an equivalent, you know, and not that anything is wrong with that, but we've, we've moved on from those days and from history of what our, you know, jobs entailed. And so we are career scientists and we just communicate instead of doing it another way. So it's, it's definitely a top priority for me to get that out there. I know it's a tough word, but meteorologist, that's how you say it. <laughs> Chief meteorologist yes, of ABC yes. News, Good Morning America. Yes. So guys, Again, questions, any, any questions for Ginger at www.onmogul.com. We're going now to a question from P.T. Phillips. Give us a glimpse of a typical day of work for you. You, you did mention that, but yeah. um, what time do you wake up, get to work, and uh, get home? Mm -hmm. You addressed much of that, but um, in terms of w when you do get home, is, is there downtime, or and what time do you yeah. go to bed? Yeah, oh my gosh, I try to go to bed before 9.30. If I do that, I've, I've won, because then I get six hours of sleep, and that's pretty good. Um, if I don't get that much sleep, depending on what the baby's doing, and whatever's happening, um, I definitely try to reserve a little time for a nap, a, def a workout sometimes, so that's what I'll get in between the two. And I try my best to just take face makeup off so I can keep my eye makeup on because it saves so much time when I end up going back to work uh, because of that split shift. So I smell a new segment. Yeah, yeah right. With Ginger Z. Right. That would a lot of us really do good. it at ABC. Because I'm not the only one that does both shows. A lot of the correspondents do that as well. Oh. Yeah. All right. Uh, here's a question from Alice. Hi, Ginger. Such a big fan. Do you have such a thing as a favorite weather story that you've covered? Oh, yeah. Is there such a thing as a favorite kind of weather to cover? Absolutely. Um, and, and it always comes off wrong. I think when people ask me, what's your favorite type of weather to cover, it's my favorite type to forecast, and that would be severe weather or tornado. Um, for me, that's what I spent so much of my education focused on. Uh, I had storm chasing as a class in college, so we actually got to go and storm chase for three credits for 10 days in the plains. And I found in that first experience that learning from the atmosphere, smelling it, you know, feeling it, watching a thunderstorm and then eventually a tornado form, there's no better way to learn. Uh, someone who's only learned out of a book would be like a doctor that never worked on a patient or a cadaver. It's such a big part of our science um, and there's a way to do it in an educational and safe and scientific way and that's what we did in college. So from that moment, I feel like that's, that is, has stayed my favorite type of story to cover. Now, of course, what happened to me is throughout I was in college, I went to college and I said, I just want to do meteorology. I thought I'd be in research for a, a university at some point. I got an internship in television and that's what changed. So suddenly I was like focused on you know, the communication of the science, even though I finished with the Bachelor of Science in Meteorology, I have minors in Spanish and math, like nothing TV. I did internships and for me what was, what was so interesting in my career is I started you know in radio in a PBS station then in Flint Michigan and it wasn't until I was in Grand Rapids until I really got out in the field covering these stories and the first big storm I covered was Hurricane Katrina 
And I remember on the way there thinking, oh my gosh, scientifically, this was gonna be so fascinating. I was gonna see the storm surge and it was gonna be crazy and I was gonna do this. And it was crazy for about 20 minutes after you know the storm had passed and it was wild, but then the human part hit me. And that was the first time in my career, you know, at 24 or whatever it was, and I had been on TV for five years at that point, that I sat back and I realized this is, this is what I have to do. This is such a big part of my journey is being able to tell these stories. So Katrina got me that humanity. It, it taught me that there's well beyond the actual storm. Um, stop being a science nerd and you gotta turn into a human and you do fast. That storm I hope will never be rivaled in my lifetime because it was it was unreal what happened and, and I, I hate the what happened while I was there. Um, but it taught me so much going forward. So when I go and say it's my favorite type of storm to cover, a tornado though, I feel like we can forecast. We've gotten you know, really good at it. And I think at, at the network level, we're doing something now, being ahead of it, warning you ahead of it. And that wasn't done for a very long time. When I came in and talked to the president, Ben Sherwood, when he was interviewing me, I said, that's what I wanna do. I wanna put that warning out there rather than damage chasing and just being there for that. But absolutely answer my favorite story I've ever done is um, after one of the biggest tornadoes that I've covered and that was the Moore tornado in 2013. Moore, Oklahoma taken for a second time because in 1999 an F5 went through there. This time it was in 2013 also in May and it was um, an EF5 so similar strength. The paths while in Moore, both in Moore crossed only at one point and world news producers often ask from New York, even though they're not there, they'll say, hey, why don't you find that person or the people who were hit by both? And I'm like, I can't believe we're gonna find that. It could be in a field that it crossed. And I was a little like, eh, I don't know, I don't know. I was really tired from being on for four days straight chasing all these storms. And we get to this place and standing in a plastic poncho is 93 year old Nancy E. Davis. This woman who had been hit her home by both F5s, EF5 and F5, um, both more tornadoes. She was, I believe it was one in three trillion chance or something, I have to look up the number, but her story, finding that character to connect to such a horrific event, and then telling her story of survival, that was my favorite. Also because she was so hopeful and so wonderful. And if you have a chance, I don't know, it's just one that I think everybody should watch. It's such a great story and it's all about her. Nancy E. Davis. Nancy nice. E. Davis. Nice. She says at the beginning, I'm Nancy E. Davis. I said, oh, we just, we can't say, we can't leave out the E. She said, absolutely not. 93 years old now, now 95. Right, right. Six, right. six years. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Okay, hey Ginger, this is Kevin asking. Adrian is so cute, tell him I said hi. Yeah. In terms of becoming a meteorologist, what was the biggest obstacle or setback that you have come across and how did you overcome it and what did you learn from it? Mm -hmm. Um, I think the biggest setback for me has been that labeling, I would say, but I already talked about that, so I'd say the another big setback or something challenging that I've had is is educating and keeping, I'm like the accuracy police, I'm called. So people will ask, you know, within, especially at the network level, um, it's not producer's job necessarily, we worked together, um, it's I know that you don't know as much as I know about weather, and so when you would write something, or not you necessarily, but someone at my work, I am on a constant also crusade to make sure that the atmosphere is not slandered, basically, because in any other part, politics, um, anything that we cover, everyone's very concerned about accuracy, but I think with weather, people just use words, and it's like, as a scientist, you go, oh my gosh, no, we gotta be really careful, so that's another big challenge that I think every meteorologist has to overcome and make sure it's so clear. It's a big part of our job, is policing all of the other stuff that goes on around our products, because we want it to be right. We wanna be known as the people who, who not just get the forecast right, but get the description of what happened right. If it's a typhoon, you have to call it a typhoon. You can't call it a hurricane, even though they're the same, they're different in different parts of the world. Um, if it is, you know, a post-tropical cyclone, when Hermine trans became a different, you know, mechanic, you have to do it right. You have to say that, even though it's a little cumbersome to say versus saying just Hermine or tropical, you know, tropical storm or hurricane. So those are the things that I say were challenges. Well, it makes sense, especially in this day and age when there's there's a tendency to oversimplify or, or yeah. put labels. Yeah, and I think simplification in a graphic or something can be very good if it's done right, but sometimes I'll get asked, can we just turn all of them red, all the warnings? I'm like, no, because they all mean something different. So that's, and that's, that's my job, is to describe what the storm surge is gonna look like and which counties 
are in that storm surge you know area and where the wind speeds will be highest where the heaviest rainfall will be so all of that needs to be laid out and i think there's this public responsibility we have to get it right and to, to teach people because it's always a constant education um there's so many things that i hear over and over like have you been in the eye of a tornado well there is no eye of a tornado you know there's eye of a hurricane but then it reminds me that it, at the basic level a lot of people don't know even the difference between those two and that's okay that's my job to, to educate so those are some of the challenges that i deal with on a daily basis this question comes from lydia mm -hmm. hey ginger let me just start off by saying that i am a huge fan and i love you so oh. much my question for you is what is your favorite thing about being a wife and a mother what gets you out of bed in mornings this uh uh, what things make it amazing to be a wife to Ben and a mama to Adrian? Oh, I think I never thought that I would be here. I honestly, I, my career was first. Everything I did was about storms and about being on television. Um, that was my life. And I, I, I really, if you would have asked me five years ago if I would be sitting here talking about this, I would have said absolutely not. <laughs> I didn't think it was possible. A lot of my relationships took the back seat and then didn't go well. I met Ben and it changed it he I respect him and know that as a partner we have this thing something special and something different than anyone I'd ever been with uh, dated or even you know friendship before in my life and so he kind of started that change obviously having a child it's funny because people will say wow I really see the difference in you this last year it must be dancing with the stars I'm like oh, I had a baby and that is the biggest change so knowing that I have something outside of my career because I really never did aside from you know family at home and such but that you, your mind gets so focused anytime something goes wrong now or anytime I always know I have them and that's the most beautiful support and most lovely part of life and I I think I've learned to prioritize as much as I can I'm still learning I think it's a constant progression I'm so far from perfect um, but Ben is a great communicator and he'll say hey Remember, we're, we gotta do us first, and he's, he's, he pushes us to, to have the right balance. So, uh, we've got a question from Miranda uh, from Aiken, South Carolina. I love watching you and your pretty dresses on GMA. Thank you. Uh, what is your favorite restaurant slash food? And mm -hmm. uh, do you take the subway or cab that early in the morning? <laughs> yeah. And, this... what, and what do you love about New York? Okay, so thank you for the compliment on my dresses it's very nice I know it's so funny because I forget what a big deal that is and it I'll be like all excited about talking about how how fast the wind speeds are in a typhoon and it's just a bunch of messages on my dress I'm like wait but the typhoon um, but it is very nice because I, I realize uh, that it's such a huge part of what we do the professional manner and the way you dress and um, anyway so thank you and then my favorite food and type of restaurant I'm really into just straight sushi I like a good sashimi I I'll allow myself a roll here and there. There's one, a pink lady it's called. It's a very simple roll, I like that a lot. Um, and then what was the second part? Uh, about... Do you take the subway or cab? Ha! I know, this is so my husband makes a lot of fun of me, but it is very early in the morning, so we do have a car service. So he, but he makes fun of me because I, he says, I don't know New York the way that most New Yorkers know the struggle. Not that I, I take the subway other places if I have to go downtown for anything, appointments, I absolutely do. But that early in the morning, it wouldn't probably be safe for me to do it. So we have a car service, thankfully, and um, yeah, I'm and grateful. I, and I have to ask, when you're on the subway, do you go stealth? Do you have a disguise? Oh, subway, I feel like in New York City, nobody cares. They don't care that I'm there, <laughs> like, whatever. And actually, you know when I do get recognized, when I have no makeup on, and when I feel like, oh, uh, that's the time that you get recognized, of course. <laughs> Always. Lydia asks, if you were to do Dancing with the Stars again, mm -hmm. what dance would you want to do that you didn't dance last season? You know, watching last night, the cha-cha. I forgot, like, we never got to do the cha-cha. I would do the cha-cha tomorrow if I could learn it tomorrow. And a question from Amanda. Mm -hmm. Hi, Ginger, such a big fan. What's your advice to young women who want to pursue meteorology or want to become an on-camera meteorologist? Great. So I think that question is awesome because um, obviously the education is number one. You have to get the science degree. You have to. Second, though, 
at this point, depending on if you're in high school or middle school right now, doing job shadows and getting different parts of meteorology. So go to the National Weather Service, go to a television station, or reach out to them on, online and just say, hey, I'm really interested. You'll be surprised at how many people write back and say, sure, we'd love to have you in. Because that will give you that little window into if you really like it or not, because you may not really know. Um, and then I'd say most importantly, something I didn't have is this. Everybody's got one now. It would have taken a whole production for me to videotape myself, but now everybody can do a forecast every day. So if you want to, this is the best way to practice. Have somebody stand with you in the mall, in wherever you are at home, in your closet. I don't care where you do your forecast. Keep working on you speaking to a camera, and that is the most invaluable part of, of what you can do to prepare yourself on a daily basis. Did you do things like that? I did some, I mean I worked, but again, I didn't really think I was going into TV. So you'll see me in my Storm Chase video in college, I'm ducking away from the camera. Like I would say I was more shy than anything, but once I decided that I did want to go into TV, I went full force and I did everything I possibly could. I got into radio, I went, I, I, I just said, since I'm not studying it, I need to get the experience. And I'd say that's what people could do right now is, you know, and then of course, study on your own. There's so many great websites and so many ways to learn about weather. Um, I could name many, many, but I won't. There, you could just Google them. <laughs> I love that you were brave enough to chase a storm. Oh, yeah. shy. Shy from the, from the camera, <laughs> yeah, of course. Okay, what are your thoughts on how men and women are treated when it comes to TV news? Mm -hmm. Do you think that women are still held to a higher standard than men when it comes to how they look and especially how they age and how much or how little they weigh, or do you think it's getting better? I think there's improvement, always. I think that the, the world is improving in general. Um, I, I wanna stay hopeful and hope that's happening, but there's absolutely n nothing fair <laughs> at this point about it. Um, and I don't, think it's, I don't think it's always on each side. I think sometimes men get a harder rap on certain things. Clothing is one of those things that has been in my forefront, in my face all the time. I'm often envious of the guys who can wear a, the same suit several times and then the tie, because, you know, I mean, even just financially, it's such a break for them. <laughs> um, switch up the tie and they're done. They're always, always comfortable in the studio. I'm freezing every single day. Those, those, those are like basic, very, very minimal things, but it, it is something that's unfair. Financially, it is not even. I know that for a fact. We, you know, that is pretty, that's been drawn out and I think that needs to change. Um, and then I'd say, as far as response, the other thing though, and, and I talk about this too, if Amy and I are great friends and we're at a desk together and I, and we have a great relationship and we can kind of poke at each other and have fun, I think the way that women are treated is differently. If two men poke at each other and have some fun, that's a bromance. Two women do it, I think it often gets taken wrong. Like it would be like, ooh, why is she doing that to her? When really it was like, no, we have a woman romance. Like we really enjoy each other's company and we, we laugh outside of the camera, but something happens when the camera comes on that I don't think that that's even. So it's an interesting dynamic that way that I find is, it's not that it's unfair, but it's different for sure. Um, so there's gotta be other ways to work around that because woman to woman is taken always differently. And Here's a question from Miranda. You've done so many amazing things on GMA. What are some of the most fun and crazy things you've ever done? Oh my gosh. So tops are, I love that we went to Iceland and did the drone in the volcano. That was just, I, I, it's so surreal. And I, that was one of those moments that I wish I would have had the kind of, I, I had some sort of thing happen after the baby and with dancing where I was able to focus on one thing. I was able to be in the moment more than I ever have. I wish I would have done that then because that event, I remember in the helicopter after we were gone thinking, what just happened? <laughs> we were, we flew in, I did world news. They said, you gotta do world news and then we're gonna fly out and you have to be on GMA the next morning in Iceland. So it was like an overnight landed, two hour drive, two hour helicopter ride. Uh, to this, you know, fissure of a volcano, and it was the most amazing scientific ability of this. So we had this um, geologist who was with us, and he was almost in tears watching science unfold in front of him. Something that he would never be able to do before: measure that close into a volcano temperature. Eventually, how much we could do. You could see it in his eyes that he was so happy, and and it was such a cool moment and such a teachable moment. When I was looking at social media afterward the teachers and students and parents and everybody. I had more response to that event and that meant so much to me. So that one was big. Um, Viet, 
Vietnam doing the biggest cave in the world um, and, and hiking. It was a 10 day trip, it was wild. I was newly pregnant and couldn't tell anybody. So that one's memorable. It smelled really bad, <laughs> really bad. <laughs> it's something that a lot of people don't realize. Um, it sounded like that too. It sounded like birds, like really? swallows. Yeah, really? the, these really fast birds. So it was just a constant, um, you had to just, it was, you were constantly being hit by them. So it was an interesting trip, but also like fascinating. Again, scientifically, you were down there, and people, scientists that were, you know, there in the vicinity of us, were finding species that have never been seen on Earth. So knowing that those places still exist, as a scientist and as someone who's fascinated by the world and our environment, that was really cool. Um, I could keep going. I have a million stories. And you jumped out of an airplane. Though, jumped out of an airplane. To me, that was like that. That's a Tuesday. <laughs> on, on live TV, though. Folks, on live know, TV, on right. On live TV. Were you nervous at all? No, I wish I had that in me. I'm, I'm a very, like, heights don't bother me at all. You know what makes me nervous? Driving. That is what makes me nervous. That, anytime I get behind a wheel, I'm way more nervous than I was sitting live TV on, uh, at the door of an airplane. I actually remember thinking, I'm hungry. I should have eaten more. And that was it. Like, I just, it's so funny. I have a very different brain, I think. It compartmentalizes things differently. Well, it's a very Googleable moment, folks. If you haven't seen it, Ginger Z jumping out of a plane yes. at what height? That was 10,000. So I had done it at 13, which is like the time before oxygen, but the time before, yeah. Amazing. <laughs> so that was a couple of years ago on GMA, a really must see cool. moment. Okay, um, Ginger, do you ever get starstruck? You meet so many people every day on GMA. Is there someone who even you were excited or nervous or really amazed to meet? Do you know I, I, this just happened to me for the first time because I always kind of like anticipate it and I would have thought George Clooney. No, I felt totally normal and, and, and it was wonderful. Uh, I would have thought Jennifer Lopez. No, nope, I really enjoyed her and she was wonderful and I didn't have any like fluttery anything. The new Bachelor. <laughs> This is so weird. He made me shake. I was so, and yes, I watched The Bachelor. That's another one of the, but it's not even that. It's not even that I had seen him on television and then he was in front of me. He is so charming and he's like, like that Bill Clinton magnetism. I know, super weird. Um, him, and then this is another weird one, Alex Trebek, when I did Celebrity Jeopardy. <laughs> I was obsessed. I don't know. I, I can't explain myself except for that. I have to ask two quick follow-up questions on this, though. Well, first of all, The New Bachelor is so contentious. Oh, but it's such a great idea. I mean, it's the smartest thing ever, and now meeting him, after, and I talked to Chris Harris the next day, and I said, Chris, Nick is everything. And he's like, I know. <laughs> Even in Chris's position, he knows that. Right, and, and he, but he's been such a bone of contention, always yeah. the one that they were saying he's not there for the right reasons. Not there for the right reasons. Have you ever said that to yourself at home? Or like a, that he's not in the right, I don't, I don't care if he's there for the right reasons. I really don't. Just, just, just card. Yeah. Okay, we're switching out a card. Switching out a card. So that's okay, but we're still doing Facebook Live, that's okay. Yeah, I'm okay. still gonna. All right, um, and then uh, in, in terms of, you have a new show about food. Yes. Was this a passion project, and what's the most interesting thing you learned in doing the show? I have been pitching the show for five years that I've been at ABC, and I'm so happy I'm doing it. It's called Food Forecast. And basically it started, I was a consultant briefly uh, for Kendall Jackson when I was in Chicago. So I was a meteorologist in Chicago. They, they came to me and said, hey, people trust you with the weather here. We are moving some things in Napa and we want a meteorologist to explain microclimates in Napa. And so I went and I talked to these investors at this big party and, and it, seeing the two things that I love most, climate and wine or weather and wine. I thought, that's a show. That's gotta be a show. And and obviously weather and wine is slightly more limited, even though you could do a lot with it. Um, so I kept thinking, because I grew up on a you know small farm and certainly in a rural area where people rely on agriculture. I thought, wouldn't that be the best is to put those two things that people love, food on TV and then weather and kind of bury a little science in there so people really learn. And so my intention with each of these episodes is first to have you absolutely start understanding what's on your plate, realizing where it comes from, going a little in that Mr. Rogers vein of like going to the production of it, seeing how it's done, so that you respect and admire the work that's put into it because I feel like that has been lost a lot of places. And then are there challenges that these people are facing and do they have to do with the weather? A lot of times there are and so that's the type of story that we're going after, whether it's a positive or a negative happening with the way that a growing season has changed or we've shifted where growing seasons move on the map. 
that's all fascinating to me. And so it's a little niche, it's a little, it's a little focused, and it's definitely a lot sciencey. But if you're ready to learn and sit down and, and enjoy and also be highly entertained, I hope, by the characters that we meet, this is such a dream for me because again, the way television has changed, you don't always get to sit down, meet a character see them evolve, see their product or whoever they are evolve and see how it all works. This really allows for the time and you can find it on, on an a ABC News app. So like if you're on Apple TV or Roku or whatever and you click on the ABC News app, it's right up in there. And then it's also online digitally. So food forecast. Food forecast. Okay, great. And so all of the episodes are there. Yes. And we're, we're going to start a new season, hopefully starting filming soon. Excellent. I've got a question from Maddie. Hi, Ginger. What is it like to work in morning TV? How is the aspect of the industry changing with the rise of digital? Mm, that's a great question. So just in general, working in morning TV, I think, is my favorite type of TV because I've worked uh, at all hours of television, although I did love Dancing with the Stars. That, that, that primetime type of like entertainment show is a whole beast of its own. It was awesome, and they're such a... They're the consummate professionals, and they're such a well-oiled machine there. I loved it. Um, but as far as mornings go, once you get over the fact that you've gotten up at 3.30 a.m. and the rest of your life will never be the same, <laughs> and you're going to always be a little tired, I think the beauty of it is you get to start the morning with everyone. You get to have that moment, and you get to you get to be that smile, hopefully, that people see or wake up to. And that's, that's a huge responsibility, but also such an opportunity, I feel like, sharing that moment with people. Most people are pretty happy in the morning, I'd say. That's the majority of the people I work with, and I love going to work and having that energy. The first, I remember filling in at GMA, though, because like, you know, in local news, it's very small. There aren't many people in the room. There are usually robotic cameras. I went and filled in for Sam that first time when I was on weekend GMA. I had such a headache for the first day because it's so stimulating. There's like lights, and there's puppies over here, and there's kids, and it's crazy. Um, and then once you get into it, when we don't have that, I'm like, why is it so quiet? So it's been, I'd say, just such a joy to be in mornings, and I hope to be in it for a very long time. No, you, you explain it beautifully. For yeah. those who have not been privy to being in a morning mm -hmm. show studio, it's literally, it's, it's not even a three-ring circus. It's often a five or six. Five, six, seven rings. Right, yeah. and how many segments? Tell people now how many segments oh, are you doing a day. And there, well, I, I'm doing, you know, four or something very short uh, segments, but it's what's going on around you, and that's the that's the cool part. That's the part that, you know, behind the scenes, and that's what we're going to actually be trying to do a little bit more of, which is what people, that was the second part of the question, is how is morning television evolving greatly? And it's evolving right in front of our eyes. This last two weeks, GMA, we've made changes to go toward what we hope people will want to see, because everyone can get, and this is so applicable to me, because so many people will go, oh, I have my weather, it's right here on my app. Your app's not perfect, I don't know if you've noticed. <laughs> So I, I feel safe that I'm still in a headline situation where we've got a big storm. You need expertise to explain that, to get into the science. Uh, but there's going to be other ways to, you know, utilize my strengths or my talents, and that's what we're doing in Morning TV is finding that other thing that makes you want to come and spend your morning with me, and makes you want to learn that part of the weather with me instead of reading it. That's what we have to do. It is a competition of that sort. Um, and if you don't, you don't. But we've got to grab you in other ways digitally. And so it's an expansion of what we've done. It's a a lot more behind the scenes. That's the stuff. And I was telling them, actually recently, there's a, an MTV does this where on their shows, and I watch Catfish too. So there's a little. It's called a cluster buster. It's like a 15 to 30 second moment that has nothing to do with the actual show you're watching. It doesn't have to connect. It's not a tease to what's coming up. It's actually just a moment where you get to know the hosts better. And I said, there's an opportunity for us to do something like that because that's what people, I would think, want to know. Responding to stuff like this, being able to interact. That is, I think, what you'll see a little bit more of and I hope to be a part of individually. Um, building that out and then honoring the people that come there. I can't believe, you talk about waking up early, our biggest fans are the folks that come to GMA, that come and see us in Times Square and now we have them in an audience. So being able to not just have them sit there and smile pretty, and clap and do all that stuff, but recognize them, find out their stories, that human touch of Good Morning America. These women this morning from Dayton, Ohio and Cincinnati were in from um, their little boutique that they were, you know, that they buy things from New York and they were here for Fashion Week. And they were like, it was overwhelming, it was this. I loved hearing their story and their perspective because I'm from Michigan, I'm not from here, this place is crazy. <laughs> and it's so good and fresh to have those folks on too. So I think that's something that you'll be seeing more of.
especially for me. That connection, yeah. right, that, absolutely. Okay, so here's a question. Ginger, do you believe in global warming and what should our world be doing to help save our planet? Mm -hmm. um, is our global warming? Yes, there's no uh, question of that. That's not a question, so it's not really. The, the debate, I think, is what people always have to have that second level of are humans responsible for that climate change? Um, I think it's a little silly to think that we haven't changed anything uh, because you know, even studying boundary layer meteorology when I was in college, you put in a target parking lot or a big box parking lot or you put in a soybean field or you leave it natural grasses, you will change the microclimate. Absolutely. You've just changed the temperature. You've just changed how much evapotranspiration happens when you put in a monoculture of a farm. Absolutely we've changed it. There's no question. Have we changed it on a bigger scale than the sun can? I don't think so. Um, but at the same time, I think the whole storyline story line needs to change. It shouldn't be called any of that. It should be, hey, don't let's not have dirty water and dirty air. That's it. You know, for health for us right now, that's what we're affecting right now. I just did the story for Food Forecast on the Long Island Sound and how southern New England, the number of lobsters, has significantly diminished by 70% in a decade. That has put so many lobstermen out of business. A big part of that was, was overfishing. Um, a big part of it was shell disease and predators. Shell disease and predators seem to enhance when the temperatures warm a bit in the ocean. So that's a part of it. But we talked to the lobsterman who had been there for 30 years and he said, I can tell you the one thing that definitely has changed and that's that we dump all of our snow uh, with all the chemicals from the roads right into the sound into my bay. We dump, um, they constantly spray for mosquitoes for the beaches to have, you know, mosquito free times. And um, so the insecticide goes in and he said immediately when they do that, they see the near shore species come up dead. You poison their environment, they're gonna be poisoned. So that it's, it's to me, that's the story. I, I think it's, it gets so convoluted and people get so political and weird about it. And it's not necessary. It's like, you can't, you can't tell me, no one can tell me that we have not negatively impacted with our industry and with our regular daily I mean we all love having a, a toilet to flush but that has to go somewhere and I think if you ask on the street how does the septic work how does the sewer work where does your trash go do you have any idea I think those are the questions that we should ask ourselves and then if there's an, an impact in a, in a greater you know global um, temperature and all that impact wonderful but I think it needs to be more hey look at your ground right here Look at your groundwater. Look at the, you know, there's so many things that are so immediate that are affecting you right now. That's what you got to be worried about, and that's what you need to make change. In terms of, okay, the next question we've got from Janet. Uh, I watch GMA every day. I'm a loyal viewer. What inside scoop can you give us on what it's like to work there and what your colleagues are like? Hmm. Inside scoop. Uh, yeah, so my, I'd say to work at GMA, again, is, is, it's a circus that's the best circus in the world. I think I'm, I'm very fortunate. I know I'm so fortunate to have this job. I've worked really hard to get here, so I, I agree. Um, but it's a, it's a constantly changing evolution of, of people who love what they do. I'm not alone. I mean, most of the people I work with behind the scenes and the ones that you see on TV are so happy to be there. And I think hopefully that comes across. Um, people, I'd say Robin in general has been my number one cheerleader. She's the one that's always looking out for me. She's the one that's going to help. She's been there, you know, some of the longest and I trust her and I believe in her and I love what she does. I think she's so good at television, not because she reads something well or that she does a great interview because she does both of those things. What she does is she looks around the room and I've learned so much just from watching her, like observing on the side. She looks around the room and she'll say, She'll figure out something about someone and that little, that part that's gonna make us different and set us apart, we don't care how was the set of, you know, I'm just doing an example of, you know, um, what's the zombie show? Walking Dead? Walking Dead. So we have someone from Walking Dead and she doesn't just, I don't even know if she did this, but it's an example of what it would look like. And she would say, oh, but you know, your shoes, those wouldn't work in Atlanta. And how does, so it's not how is it on set or how's the camaraderie. It's like a really good question that has to do with what they're doing right now. And I think that is something that she's so great at. Um, then there's Michael, you know, who's just joined full time. And he has, I think what he's great at is the generosity. Generosity in TV is very difficult. Knowing who you're talking to, knowing the room and how you can, when you make someone else look better, you look better. He is 
key at that. He is so good and so curious and he asks really great questions in the most personal, normal manner, like everybody at home's thinking that. And that's, I believe, something that's gonna help all of us. Um, and he also comes in the room and hugs and kisses everybody every morning. It's awesome, he's such a great energy. So those are examples of like the people that I work with that I, I admire. It's like I'm constantly studying, I'm always watching. Because for me, they're the best, and and I want to keep learning to be more and more like them. Well, that's what makes you the best. That I you're always looking. So. so it's <laughs> it's great. Um, question from Malika: How do you balance being a busy woman within media, a wife, and a mom? Mm -hmm. Has it taken time to find that balance? Oh my gosh, I think it's a constant evolution, and I'm never going to be fully balanced. I think anybody that says that's probably lying. Um, and you're always going to feel guilty. I don't know. There's on both sides. You know, I feel like especially after I had the baby and I was doing dancing, it was such a great habit to get in because it made me prioritize. If I had an hour to spend with that baby, there was no phone, there was no anything else, it was me and the baby. And I got very good at focusing, being in that moment. Never in my life have I been so on it. Um, I've always procrastinated. I've always said, oh, I'll wait until later, I'll do that later. I don't have time later. You gotta do it right now. Uh, whether it's a workout or getting a presentation done, I'm speaking at a weather conference tomorrow. And I couldn't do that. I said, I have to get it done now because I need to spend time with that child and I need to focus. And so it's it's not about are you great at balancing, it's about how you prioritize. And at the end of the week or the end of the day or whatever it is, do you, I feel confident and powerful and like I did a good job if I made sure to, to you know touch everybody as much as I possibly could and get, <laughs> I hope they know that I care and love them and the, you know Ben, the baby, and then everything else. And so as long as I'm doing that, I think I'm all right. And I gotta take care of myself. That's the one that you always let go, but you can't. And I've noticed a big difference in those days that I do let myself not nap, not work out, not do the things that, not eat right. Those are functional things. Those are, those are like, you have to do that. And I think people often allow that to slip. So that helps me to stay balanced. And if you let go of some perfectionism? Oh my gosh, you have to. I'm, I am always the person that wants everyone to like me. I want everything to go good. I don't want any negative comments. I don't want, as I've gone through, I've gotten much more resilient and I've gotten much more, I allow myself more leniency. I, mean, I give myself a little room, a little squeeze room, or I also just realize what's important and what's not. And I think I'm, I'm getting better at that. I still have a lot of work to do though. <laughs> All working moms. We're too. all it's always yeah. a work in progress. Oy. Okay, how about uh, Jen wants to know about local TV? Oh yeah. Let's um, talk. What was that like? And yeah. did you always want to work at a major network? Okay, so that's a great question. Local TV is my favorite. I actually miss it a lot of times. I'll, it's funny because I will go back and watch pieces that I did when I was like 24 from Grand Rapids, um, and I'm proud of them. I love. There are such opportunities in local where you can still tell that story, where you can still get into that person in your community, and you can have a real impact. Not that we can't on a national level, but there's definitely a difference. And in weather, whew, it's a big difference. So I miss my three minute weather cast so much. Um, but hey, I can do it in 15, let's go. So I think that part I miss and I, and I love. Local was so, you know, as much as, and it's funny because I was at a tornado a couple of years ago. Um, in Alabama and one of the local reporters said oh my gosh what's it like at the network and I said well you know when you're covering news and weather I feel like we're both at a tornado right now so you know we both haven't used the restroom we both are hungry we both are you know sleeping in an hour away <laughs> hotel where because the town was taken out so it's you're covering news is covering news you gotta love it and, and fortunately I do so did I always want to be in a network? Absolutely. The second I said to myself, I'm going to be in TV instead of being in research or whatever else I had wanted in meteorology, I said, I better go for it. I better go all the way. And I thought this was the top. So I, I made a goal. I said, at the time I was working in NBC, so I said, today show 10. That was my password for all of my emails. And um, I said, I had to be on today show by 2010. Well, I got on by 2008. I had filled in, which was great on the weekend. Um, and then I got the job, I was filling in at MSNBC, and I got the job at ABC, and I think I thought, well, this is it, right? And now I've noticed and, and realized that this is just the beginning. Um, this is just the platform. This is the part where I can take science and hopefully inspire, especially young girls, and that's my goal. So coming in November, I have a book due. Um, yeah, a fictional book, but it's a 
it's kind of like an exacerbated reality. It's about a young girl who's a storm chaser um, and who becomes a storm chaser. Her town gets taken out. There's this whole storyline. And there's a lot of science buried in there. So I'm hoping, and it'll be a trilogy eventually. You have to, I'll keep you guys updated on when it comes out. Um, but that one, I have another book I'm working on as well. And then I've got Food Forecast and I've got a couple of other projects. My husband and I are working on a show. It's been a big, 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 big to do. Anyway, it's a, it's a house flipping show. Yep, so there's a lot of ways and a lot of things I feel like I didn't realize this is just the start. And and I'm, I'm so fortunate to have this this place and I'm, I love my job, but I realized, oh my gosh, there's so much more to do. I've got a question from Dale. He mm -hmm. wants to know, Ginger, did you always want to be a meteorologist? Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to be a meteorologist since I was probably eight. I, I fell in love with thunderstorms coming across Lake Michigan and my my brother and I would be out there and my mom would be freaking out. She's very overprotective. Like we'd have a 15 mile per hour gust anywhere in the house, whatever. She's like, get in the basement. So I think I was really interested about it, uh, by it. Um, and then I was in high school and one of my professors said that you're always talking, or professors, my teachers said you're always talking about it. Why don't you think about going into meteorology? And I was like, wow, I didn't even, like, I don't know why, but it wasn't even in my head. So my senior year, there's this really funny video. I'm on the homecoming court and you know, they announce everybody, Ginger's going to San Diego State to study orthodontics. I'm like, how? I wasn't confident enough to say I knew that I wanted to study meteorology, but one year from that moment, I was at Valparaiso University studying meteorology. And I'm so glad that I finally suggestion for students is that if you're passionate, I can't tell you the number of people who say to me, I always loved the weather. I just didn't know what to do or I didn't you go study it. That's it. You go do it because if you love it, you're going to get a job and, and your passion will be seen in some way. You know, there's a lot of most meteorologists are not on TV. Most meteorologists are in private sector. They're in insurance, working for insurance companies, UPS, airlines. Think about all the places that need a forecast. And they're not just going to the National Weather Service because they need more of an in-touch on their product. The shipping companies, they can't waste time on a snowstorm. They can't have a truck get stuck. They need to get their product there. So they have meteorologists. And I have like friends that work at shipping companies in San Diego and you know they have to get the boats to the right places and they can't get into a storm. Interesting. Yeah. So I've got a question uh, from Steph. Uh, who says, I'm a huge fan, and it seems like you have it all. You are so blessed. With marriage, did it take you time to find the right one? And oh. did you know right away he was the right match for you? Oh, girl! That's what I said. I think it, I did not think this was going to happen. Um, I was going to be a therapy couch for a second. But, uh, no, I, it took me so long. And, again, part of it was my fault. I didn't put people first. I didn't. I just didn't. I don't know if I wasn't ready or they weren't the right person, probably not the right person. Um, ben was the first person who I met, and this is very funny, and we haven't really shared this publicly, but he'll laugh because he makes fun of me all the time. I met him, I was in love in 10 seconds, which I usually did. I was very much a diver, like, ooh, there's a relationship, I'm here. I'm like immediately misses whoever it is. Um, and that got me into trouble in the past, but I was still doing it because that's how I feel, I was passionate about it. So I emailed him right away. The second after I met him, I'm like, we need to be friends. And he's like, friends? I wasn't gonna be your friend. So we went on a date. He was very, he, he tried to kiss me on the first date. I was like, whoa, excuse me, okay, I guess he is available. Like, I didn't wanna be too aggressive with him. And he was set. Like, he says after that first date, he knew he wanted to marry me. And Ben's not one to mince words, so he was very clear. Um, he's a communicator. I was scared by that and so I think we went on two more dates and then I was like I can't see you anymore yeah I just I wasn't ready to be treated so nicely because many of us do that and I broke up with him as he calls it I said you can't break up with people if you've only gone on three dates but in his world you can um, a couple months went by or maybe that was like six weeks or something he saw me covering Hurricane Sandy and he wrote me again I was like I want you to stay safe you know basically saying whatever and I wrote him after and I hadn't talked to him anymore after that and I wrote him because I saw him on TV and I was like hey I'm just wondering how you are like then I'm reaching out again so then we do it again and then I he got too close too fast again and I was like well and I broke up with him for a second time that's right <sighs> so I am very lucky that he is persistent enough and forgiving enough that the third time that he came and said I think I had changed my hair color and he was like, are you changed now too? <laughs> and, and I was, I, I think that I finally gave myself the okay. 
And honestly, I had been going to therapy. I had been in terrible relationships where I had been treated so poorly. And I think I was finally ready and I knew I was ready. It had just taken me six months since I met him to be ready and in the place where I could accept his love and give him respect and love back. And that's what I think everybody needs to be ready to do. Um, and it doesn't happen at all points in life. So from that moment, I just, I would consistently, when his text would come up, hey, whatever it was, like way aggressive, I'd be like, okay, it's okay. He loves me and I can love him back and that's okay. Allow that. And, and the more I did that, the more amazing it felt. And the more I thought, wow, this is real life. I've never had a relationship like this where we don't talk all day. I mean, we, he texted me something funny in the morning just because the baby did something funny, but it's the most trusting and wonderful relationship. It's not outside, we have disagreements, of course, we have all those things. But with whoever said you have it all, I think I do have it all because of Ben. I think, and, and, and I didn't have it all before. Um, but I also know that this is a ridge. You know, we always say in meteorology, there's troughs and ridges, and I've definitely had some big troughs. And there are too many stories, and it's, it's way too depressing to talk about all of the troughs, but um, everyone's got a past, and I definitely had some downtime, and I know I will again in the future. Life doesn't stay right here, but I'm gonna enjoy every second of it while I'm here. And just to remind everyone, it's the last five minutes to submit questions at www.onmogul.com. We'll hit refresh one last time for anyone who wants to get the last yes, questions please. in. Um, a couple last questions um, before we hit refresh again. Um, someone asked if you and Ben met in college, but no. for those who don't yeah. know, Ginger yeah. is married to somebody in TV as well. Yep. So, so Ben's got his own. He own does. TV. He works at NBC, um, and he's a working on New York Live right now, which is their like lifestyle show. He does. He hates when I say he's a comedian, but he's a comedian. He's very funny. Um, he just does. He does opinion pieces. He does. You gotta look him up, Ben Aaron, um, and you'll laugh. You'll get a good laugh. You can watch YouTube all day and, on him, and it's gonna. You know, he just does humor like very few people can. So. He takes a topic and he doesn't, he's not mean. I find if I'm trying to be funny, I, you know, often try to punch it with like a cuss word or like, what, you know, like that's, but to be funny and not be mean um, is a very intricate and cool skill. And he has that. I think Ellen is one of the only other people on the planet that does it as well as my husband. And obviously she's pretty spectacular. Um, so I feel like he, you know, there's more to come from him and he's got a lot of little irons in the fire right now and I'm excited him going forward. Well, you mentioned the show that you two are doing. What's yeah. it like to work together with a spouse? He was so worried about this. He said, I will never do a show with you. I never want to work with you because that'll ruin everything. Until we were meeting with someone who actually works at Lincoln Square Productions, which is part of ABC. And that guy actually was the one that brought Ben from his other job to New York for NBC. Totally different story. But and he's sitting with us at dinner and we're telling him, well, Ben's like, I'm over the city. I want to move out of the city. Ben's a city guy. Like he really, yes, he grew up in a suburb in Toledo, you know, but his dad lived on the Upper West Side. He's a city guy. Um, I have, on the other hand, grown up on a small farm and <laughs> had flipped homes in Michigan. He's never done that. He's never touched a hammer. So we're talking about this and it's kind of the reverse Green Acres. And the guy says, this is a show. And we thought, if it's a positive house flipping show, that's something we could work on together. So we're gonna try it. Um, we've just had the not the anti-time of our lives, Dirty Dancing song, <laughs> Finding This House. It has been such a production. The poor show, we're trying to get it going. You have to find a house. We have bid on four houses and lost on all of them or had something so horrific like a terrible murder that had taken place that we didn't know about. I mean, like the stories just go on, so. We're hoping that the show eventually gets started here. Oh, I hope you're doing some back. Are you doing some shooting? Even oh, we're shooting the whole time. Yeah. All this stuff right. happens on camera. We're like, no way. The murder. Or the, murder the house story. that I fell in love with, um, and then they decided, you know what? It is an amazing house, but it's too nostalgic. We're going to pull it from the market. We were like, what? <laughs> anyway. I have a weather question for you. Um, so we'll get ready to wrap up with uh, Georgia is asking, why is the East Coast and Midwest so humid, but the West Coast so dry? Oh, barring drought issues. Yes, so drought obviously, but drought is because of where they are geographically. So it's the jet stream. That's the easiest, most simple description. The jet stream moves our weather and keeps certain areas more arid and dry, like the desert obviously has a, a consistent um, high part um, and that's, you know, the jet can move though. So that's why you'll have rainy seasons in California or rainy seasons in parts of Washington or Oregon State. Or you'll have very dry seasons, like the last 
two years ago, was it, when Oregon, Washington had this big blob and it was keeping the jet stream way above them, they had no snow. Unfortunately, it looks like that's trying to develop again. Um, and then as far as um, here, why we have more humidity, so the jet dips different points in different parts of the year, but it comes back up and it allows gulf moisture. So we're basically like tapping into tropical moisture because we have that ability. Up there, you don't have that. You also have a very cold Pacific Ocean, and the Pacific Ocean is not going to inspire um, a whole lot of moisture in the air. So that's that's the simple, simple answer. There's so much more I could go into that's probably too much. This has been great. I'm going to end on a question that you, almost universally we're getting from okay. our mobile followers. Um, so many uh, were... Uh, 80% uh, female millennials yeah. who are um, from all over the world and just trying to kind of get a leg up. One consistent theme that we see is that so many of these women are expressing that they have moments of self-doubt, mm -hmm. moments of low self-esteem. Do you ever have those moments still? Yes. And what do you do to pull from within and overcome them? Um, I, have, I have those moments hourly. I, don't, I think everybody does. I think self-doubt is is part of being human. I think some of us are probably harder on ourselves than anybody else possibly could be. And I think that's the, that, those are the people that I feel for, because that's me. I, I, will, I will kill myself, you know, not, not that way, but I'm saying I will come attack myself well before anybody else can possibly do that to me. So I think the, what I've gotten better at and what I can say to everyone is, again, that kind of, is this going to matter tomorrow question that you can ask yourself is, and most of the time the answer is no. Um, it sounds really frivolent to, I actually at one point behind the weather wall put up a sign that said it doesn't matter because it doesn't and you got to let go of that. It doesn't matter the, you know, you, sometimes when you make a mistake or whatever it is, you could beat yourself up forever or you can say, I won't do that again. I'm going to make all of the arrangements not to do that again, but I'm going to move forward because it doesn't help anybody, especially your own psyche. Um, Self-doubt though does make you better. So I also wouldn't run away from it, embrace it say, this is how I feel right now. How do I make myself not feel this way? What can I do in the future? Because that's the way that you're gonna improve too. Those are the people that are probably the most successful and probably on here saying the same thing. So give yourself a little a little medal for the day and say, I got here, I got to where I am right now. Um, I'm listening and talking about how to become more successful. You're on your way. Like the, I think allowing yourself to see your successes and celebrate those, even if they're minute, that will help you going forward. Um, and I also think just saying it out loud to people really helps. That's probably the third thing. You could pay thousands and thousands of dollars to sit with a professional, which I think in some cases is very necessary and I've absolutely done in my time um, and that helps, but you don't have to do that all the time. You can always call your sister, your mom, your dad, your brother, your friend. There is someone in the life that will help you and I think this it's interesting because it parallels like bullying online. I find bullying online so interesting because people don't fight back. They allow themselves to be run over and pummeled and all these things when really we all have fans. Think about it. Even someone in high school that's getting bullied online. If you repost that terrible thing and say, I'm so sorry, and, and you, you can separate their feelings and say, I'm so sorry you feel that way. You're then putting that back out there and putting positivity to it. At the same time, and slightly passively, your fans, your friends, are gonna go after that person and tell them, you can't do that, you can't. So I think there's some power in that too, realizing you don't have to do that, but knowing that you've got fans and friends and great people who love you, putting value in that is important instead of you know, tearing yourself down or allowing others to. Very well said. All right, everyone, thank you so much. This was Ginger Z, Chief Meteorologist at ABC News. Good morning, America. Um, wonderful, wonderful addition to our Ask a Mobile Anything series. And to see the full transcript, we'll have it up on www.onmobile.com later on this afternoon. Thank you, everyone, for submitting questions. And a special thanks to Ginger Yay. for joining us. Thank you. Thank, thank you for you. having me.